Good morning, Redemption Church. How we doing? Great. Glad to be here with you guys today. My name's Pastor Scott. Our lead teaching pastor is on vacation for the next few weeks, so we are taking turns uh, teaching over the next few weeks. Uh, God bless Redemption Church with some great teachers, so be sure and come uh, throughout July. Matt will be back in August, but before we start, I'm glad you guys came today. We are going to uh, pray over a team of our youth that are going on a mission trip this Saturday. So I'm going to bring them out and up along with their parents. So please come up. Look how shy they are. Isn't this cute? This is not how they are when we have our training. You can go right in front. They don't want to see me. Good job. Good job. Now let me explain what this is. This is called Rural Ministry Camp, RMC. And this is the, let's see, this is the uh, fourth community that we are uh, participating in this way. And what it is, is these group of youth are going and they're putting on three nights of youth ministry. So they are doing the greeting, they're doing the games, they are doing the uh, teaching, they're doing the worship, they're leading the small groups. They've been training for about the last six weeks in how to share their faith. They've been challenged to memorize how many scripture verses? A lot. He said a lot. And then, Somebody knows how many, 15 is good. And so they have been equipping themselves and praying over uh, this task that we've set before them. This is my favorite thing. Out of all the years I've done youth ministry, this is my favorite thing because you have people going that are, uh, many of them, how many people, this is getting you out of your comfort zone a little bit. How many people are afraid to raise their hands up on stage? Okay, good. Most of them, this is a stretching exercise for them. This is not a comfortable thing for them to do. So the fact that they're doing this is awesome. And right now, we would like to pray over them um, while this happens. And there's a dad that's coming in. Come on up, Byron. All right, parents, I would like you to uh, touch somebody while I lead us in prayer here. There you go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this team. I thank you for the, the courage and the sacrifice that this team has already uh, brought forward to go on this trip. I pray that you will guide them and guard them, give them health and safety, give them boldness and, um, and vision over what you'd have them do these, these three nights on Friday at Friday Harbor. I pray, Father, for Friday Harbor. I pray for the kids there that maybe have grown up their whole life in church but have never taken the step to bow their knee to you. I pray for those on the island that have never truly considered who you are, never really heard the gospel presented. And I pray for the leadership there that, that, that this team would lift them up as well. But most of all, Lord, I pray that over these few days that your name would be glorified. And Lord, I can't wait to hear in, in 10 days, Lord, we, we ask for a harvest that in 10 days this team will come back and share with us the names that today don't know you, but in 10 days will. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please give them a big hand as they walk off. Thank you, guys. What's that? Yes, if you've got uh, class to go to, you can go to class. If you've got, uh, but you can't leave because you heard that Matt wasn't speaking. That's all I ask. Just stay for a little bit, if you would. I'm excited about this, actually. Um, if you've got a uh, Bible or a Bible app with you, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to be in this, in the last section, starting at verse 19. And it's really an examination of how God works in us and through us by and for the church. I don't know how um, often you refer to this passage, but I, this comes up in my life almost every week. This is a, a great passage. I'm really, really excited to teach on it today. So uh, I'm going to pray us up again just to kind of get us in the right mind if you join me. Heavenly Father, I pray that um, you prepare each and every heart in here, including mine, over what you'd have us take from the reading and the study of your word this morning. I pray that you will equip us in a better way than when we walk through the doors. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Hebrews 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. So right away, this is setting the tone when it says, dear brothers. Other translations say, dear brothers and sisters. What does that mean? That means that you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, you and I are brothers and sisters adopted by the God of the universe. 
And that bond is closer than any other bond on earth. Even closer than a husband and wife. You have more in common being with, with believers. And I, I don't know about you, when I was a kid, I kind of envied people that were adopted. Did you ever run into that? kind of envied them because it wasn't an accident of birth, right? I saw some families, all the, the, the things that they had to do to adopt somebody was, like, like was very intentional, and there was all this extra trouble that they went through. So much more when God adopts us into his family, right? He made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could be adopted into his family. It is a true and meaningful relationship calling each other brother and sister. 1 Peter 2.10 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. About uh, 15 years ago, my son and I went on a short-term mission trip to Chile, and uh, we didn't speak any Spanish, and somehow we get separated from the rest of our group, and we ended up in a room about this big with 50 non-English speakers. And uh, that was kind of weird. You know, the first thing we did, we got in this room where we didn't know anybody and didn't share a common language. And I thought that would be awkward, but it was not. I was totally at peace. It was totally comforting to be with those people because they all love Jesus, and I all love Jesus. My son loved Jesus. And we had this instant bond that seemed to me it was kind of a glimpse of heaven, right? Kind of a pale glimpse of what heaven must be like when we are going to be united with our family, with our godly family, in a way that supersedes all other relationships. When it talks about the holy places here, it's referring to the temple in Jerusalem. And, you know, the temple was divided into three sections, and the center section was called the Holy of Holies. Some of you already know this, that it was segregated from the rest of the temple by a giant curtain. The curtain was, was 60 feet high, and it was 30 feet square. It was made out of 72 cords. Each cord was made of 24 strands, and it was as wide as my hand. This was a heavy curtain. This would have taken dozens of priests to manipulate, right? It was so, so heavy. And this was a symbol of this, this division, this, this dividing from where God was. This is a symbolic place of where God dwelt. The Ark of the Covenant was inside the Holy of Holies, right? And nobody could go in there because we were unfit for the presence of God, right? The Holies of Holies was a symbol of not only God's holiness and perfection, but also our inability to be in that presence. Now, of course, we have the confidence to go into the presence of God. We have the confidence to move into that presence. 1 John 5, 13, I've used this verse. I've used this verse almost every time I preach, but this speaks to me every single time. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may what? Know. K-N-O-W. They may know that you have eternal life. There is no doubt. We have confidence. We know that if we are following Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. There's no guesswork to it. Fear is gone. Right? We're never apprehensive now about being in God's presence because now we know. Now, if we were to try to enter God's presence based on our character or our, our good works or our religious affiliation, we would find no access. But we don't do that. We enter because of Jesus' efforts on our behalf. And when it talks about God being holy, I think about this a lot. You know, the word holy means separate, you know, and... and uh, so you think about going into God's presence, and he's, and he's holy. And I was reading in um, Revelation chapter 4, it talks about the throne of God. You know, it describes all the things that are going on. And one of the things it describes is these four amazing, intimidating, and scary creatures that are there, right? You should read chapter 4 if you haven't for a while. It's a, it's a very, very powerful word picture that John makes. And starting at verse 8, it says, And the four creatures... Each of them with six wings were full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never ceased to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Imagine that these beings that are so amazing that I'm sure it would blow our minds if they were on, up here with us right now. Their whole purpose in life, the reason why they were created is to proclaim the holiness of God. It gives us a little glimpse about how powerful that must be. Right? The fact that these creatures are dedicated, their, their purpose for being there is to proclaim the holiness of God. That's what was represented in this Holy of Holies. Man could not go into that except for once a year a priest was chosen to go in with a perfect lamb and offer the sacrifice for the community. God granted grace to allow that to happen. 
And it was such that since no one else could go in, one priest once a year could go in, they made provisions. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but they tied a rope around him. Because if he went in there and had a heart attack or broke his leg or whatever, anybody else that would go in there to minister to him would, would be killed. So they just yarded him out, right? If he pitched over, they would just, all right, let's pull him out, you know, because nobody would want to go in there. That's how important it was. Year after year, blood and sacrifice was required, and that happened year after year after year, but no longer. We no longer need to replenish blood and death because Jesus did that on the cross once and for all for you and for me. God understood that he must become sacrifice for us. Now the word new here, the original translation would have meant freshly slaughtered. And it's only used once in the New Testament. It's referring back to Jesus being slaughtered on our behalf. It's a new way, previously unavailable. The old way couldn't even get us into God's symbolic presence, right? We couldn't even go through that veil, go through that curtain. The new way makes it possible. This living way, the penalty is no longer sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. It's not works-based. It's based on Jesus' sacrifice once and for all for our sin. The thought about going into God's presence, by the way, would blow the Jews' minds, right? The, the thought of being in God's presence would never cross their mind at all. This would be a, a, a monumental teaching to them. They would refer back to Genesis, where God closed off the Garden of Eden and put an angel there with a flaming sword swinging back and forth, right? But now, not only can we go in with boldness, Jesus takes us in by the hand. We can go in, not because we are worthy, but because he is worthy. We're not saved by obeying God, by the way. Our salvation will lead to obedience out of gratitude. We don't earn our salvation. It is a byproduct. Our works are a byproduct of our salvation. That veil, of course, was a symbol of Jesus, and it had to be torn, just like Jesus had to be torn, to allow us to come into his, God's presence. You remember when Jesus died on the cross. Remember the exact moment that Jesus died on the cross? A few things happened. An earthquake happened, right? The, the sun went black, and that curtain, 60-foot curtain, ripped. It's very specific in the Bible. It ripped from the top to the bottom. Top to the bottom, signifying that we no longer are kept from God. The price has been paid. Jesus opens up the curtain using his flesh. That religious system was done. God no longer dwelt in some place built by man. Now we have a great priest who need not use the veil, and neither do we. There's no intermediary, intermediary between us and Jesus. We can talk to him directly. Going on to verse 21, it says, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. God's purpose really is not to get us to heaven. God's purpose is to make us more like Jesus. That's his intent. Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That's us. We're to draw near to God, not just fit him in. We're to make him a priority. He is the purpose of our life. We're to choose what is important. That's how we're to to draw near to God. Right? We're part of the church. And by the way, the church isn't a building. Right? You guys are the church. We're the church. The church building is where the church meets. Redemption Church knows that better than many churches, since we're a church without walls. And not drawing near to God actually shows an immense contempt for him and ingratitude. And it shows really our distrust of him, doesn't it? not drawing near to God, not trusting him. We're to have a true heart, and we must be genuine in our faith, but it doesn't mean that we need to be perfect. What it means is we need to totally surrender. Surrender our character, our emotions, our will to Jesus. God is not interested in a Christian that compartmentalizes his or her life. It's not, God's not interested in someone who 
you know, is, is, is a holy roller Sunday mornings, and then there's no evidence for the rest of the week. He wants every part of our life surrendered to him. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Proclaiming Lord, Lord does not mean the same as my Lord. Going through the motions, doing good works, all those things is not the same as bending your knee and saying, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. We do these not for doing works. We do these out of submission to God, any of the good that comes from our life. Because God sees our motivations, right? That's what this verse is saying. He sees why we do the things we do. It is not to elevate ourselves in the eyes of men. It's not to elevate ourselves in his eyes. It is submission to who he is. Acts 8, 18 through 23 says, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You ha have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. For your heart is not right before God. What does he say to do? Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. God is most interested in our heart. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Jesus doesn't want much. He just wants everything. Right? He just wants our life. That's all. Everything else will come easy if we just surrender that. Stop, stop holding back, you know, this thing that I'm holding onto this thing right here because I just don't trust God with that. Whatever that is, or my kid or my job or my savings account or my whatever, my, my, my future, my retirement, my health. He wants it all. He wants our heart. Our assurance and faith in Christ work on our behalf is our conviction and our certainty of faith, right? It's not through what we do. It's what he did. That's where our assurance comes from. When it talks about the, the water, it's referring back to the, the rituals that the priest would have to go to to be worthy to go in to the Holy of Holies, right? He would be washed and dressed. It was a whole procedure that they went through. But now that's superseded by Jesus' sacrifice. That's no longer required. The Holy Spirit now, as followers of Jesus, is changing our life. The Holy Spirit is sanctifying us, making us righteous. We are clean now, hard and off, because of what Jesus did. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. I love that phrase to hold fast. Hold fast. If I ever open another business, I am naming it Hold Fast. I'm making a declaration right now. I hope it's something cool. I hope it's a speed shop or a tattoo parlor or something like that. But Hold Fast is a cool mental picture, isn't it? To hold fast. We're to hold fast to God. This reminds me of a story uh, when my family was young. Probably 20 years ago, I took my family to Lake Chelan, uh, the coldest lake in North America, I think. And uh, one of the things we did was we rented a uh, wave runner, right, a, a personal watercraft. We rented a big one. And, uh, and i got to confess, those are not for me. They, they don't do anything for me. They're, I was pretty bored. And so at the end of the rental time, I thought, well, I'm going to go out and mess around with it. And, and I, when I checked it out, I said, all right, rental guy, um, what happens when I flip this thing over? And he said, these big ones you can't flip over. I said, really, you can't flip them over? No, nope, you can't flip them over. Go, what happens if we do? Don't worry about it. We've never had one flip over. We've been running these for, you know, a thousand years. We've never had one flip over. I said, okay, never had them flip over. So we're going out, and I'm sitting in the middle, and Patty's on the back, and Albany's in the front. And she was uh, four years old at the time. And so I said, Albany, 
Um, you know, I don't want you flying off here, so just hold on to the handlebars, a little cross piece right there, and just hold on to that tight, and, and you'll be good. And so we started driving around, and you know, Lake Chelan is, I'm not sure God, why God made it that way, but it is narrow, right? And everybody wants to be in the same place. Like, we're out there, and there are boats going by, and they're dragging people and various, various devices, and uh, I, I'm going in circles, right? And I figure, well, this is kind of fun, and I'll go a little tighter circle. I'm going tighter and tighter, and I'm submarining the bow under the wake, you know, that I'm making, and yep, all of a sudden, boom, that thing flips over before I knew what was happening. I'm underwater. I pop up, and Patty pops up, and there's boats all racing around, and there is no Albany. And I'm looking around in this crazy scenario, right? And I'm, I'm just panicked, right? And, and by the grace of God, all of a sudden it came to me, I know where she is. She's upside down holding onto those bars underwater. Because she trusted her dad, and her dad said, hold on to that and everything will be fine. Hold fast, and that's exactly what she did. Even when circumstances would have told her, don't do that, she did it. And I think that's what God is calling us to do. Now, our enemy, Satan, wants us to loosen our, our grip. He does not want us to hold fast. Particularly when there are things in our life, there are challenges and circumstances that don't make sense to hold on. That's when, when Satan takes notice. But that's the time we need to hold on the hardest. That's when we need to be firmly holding fast. We need to confess with our lips and hold fast with our actions and our life without wavering, not because of what we do, but evidence in what he has done for us. That's why we hold fast. The flip side of that fear is self-reliance, isn't it? Right? God does not change, and neither should we. We are to hold fast. James chapter 1 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of, a sea, of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We are to hold fast. If you don't remember anything else today, hold fast. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works. Consider, pay attention, look closely, make this a priority. This affects who we are and what we do. Jesus' followers have a high calling to care for and stimulate each other spiritually. We're to come alongside each other and set an example. We're to demonstrate our salvation. We are to motivate each other to good works. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That is an interesting way to look at church. That's an unusual way to look at church, I think, for a lot of people in the United States, right? Don't we tend to think of church from a consumer standpoint? Don't we? When you've moved into a new area and you needed to, to find a church, I've done this, don't you use the term your church shopping? That's a consumeristic word, right? Our, our, you know, we look at a church and we say, I love this church because the, the chairs are so comfortable, but this one has a center aisle. I love this church because the music really touches my heart, but this one has the light show that is unbelievable, right? Or this one has a snow cone machine in Sunday school, and this one, it gets out so I can do whatever it is I want on, on Sunday. We kind of think that way about the church, that it's a consumer experience, and that's not what the Bible lays out. It doesn't talk about that. We have a, a saying around the office sometimes to take off your diaper and put on your apron, right? And if I were to make it for Duval, it would be take off your diaper and put on your Carhartt. I think I gotta, gotta change that. It makes it more, a little bit more sensitive to our environment. And part of that is, well, first off, let me brag on Redemption for a minute. Redemption Church is a pretty amazing church. One of the things is when, when pastors get together, invariably, It'll eventually get to numbers, right? It'll, how many people were saved, and how many people are attending, and how many people are serving, that kind of stuff. Redemption Church has an amazing, amazing record or, or percentage of people that are serving. Over 70% of our people are serving. That, you know, when I share that with other pastors, they always think I should confess that that's a lie, right? Because the norm, generally accepted, is 20%. Most churches, 20% of the people do all the work. 
Our church is much, much higher, and I brag on that all the time. That is an amazing thing about Redemption Church, that we are gifted about that, that thing by God. But part of it is, so many times I hear people say, um, you know, I say, why did you leave your last church? And they'll say, um, well, I wasn't being fed. I think you weren't being fed. Um, have, how, have you been a Christian in a while? You've been following Jesus? Oh, yeah, like 30 years. And I think, okay. Well, it's important that we choose a church that is teaching the, the gospel, right? That the word is proclaimed. But if I've been a Christian for 5 or 10 or 30 years, I probably need to be thinking about feeding people rather than being fed exclusively. Right? The thought of a, somebody who's been a Christian for 30 years and demands to be fed or complaining that he's not being fed, just, I just picture in my mind a guy in a diaper sitting in, you know, a grown man in a diaper sitting in a high chair banging on his, on his tray for food. It's time to mature. It's time maybe to feed others. Ephesians 4 talks about this a little bit. Starting at verse 11, it says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The Catholic Church got the saints wrong. Okay? The saints are not Christians that have been dead a couple hundred years on the wall of Catholic churches, right? The saints are you and I if we're following Jesus Christ. We are the saints. And God gave Redemption Church teachers to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ until we obtain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood so that the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and by deceitful schemes. That is part of the purpose of church. For us to be trained to go do the work of the ministry. Church is not a spectator sport. Right? Everybody's a player. And I have some people say, well, I like to go to the big churches. I go, really? That's cool. You like to go to the big churches? Why? Well, I like the anonymity because I can go, nobody knows me, and I leave. I get it, but that's not biblical. Right? There's nothing wrong with a big church, but you must be known. You must be involved. You must be as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, right? We're supposed to be helping each other, inspiring each other. We're to become more like Jesus through the church. 25 goes on, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Neglect is the same word for, uh, translated as forsake when Jesus was on the cross, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a serious word. We are not to turn our back on our, our fellow believers. We are called to be part of their growth. Sometimes I know that church attendance is affected by circumstances, right? At this time, it was probably persecution, not neglecting to meet together. That The church was under severe persecution at the time, so that would be a pretty good excuse. Well, do you want to go to church, honey? No, we'll probably be killed. Okay, I can see that a little bit. Now, now it's, it's probably more apathy right? We're not under threat of, of punishment right now. We are encouraged to meet together, to assemble, to assemble the parts, right? That's another way to think about it. We're assembling the parts. Why? Because the church is a body. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says, rather speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head unto Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together with every joint which with it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Jesus is our senior pastor. He's the head of the church, but the rest of us are the body. So when one of us is not here, part of the body is missing. And, you know, each part of our body serves a purpose, and if we just randomly pull some section out, the body's going to be affected, right? God supernaturally bring, brings people together into a church to do his will, to do the mission of the church. We need to remember to look at the church from God's perspective, for what his intention is for the church. Now, I've talked to people, and you probably have too, that say, well, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. I love Jesus, but I hate the church. And to that I say, hmm. And I think, all right, well, if you came up to me, and said, Scott, 
uh, you are a great guy and I want to be your friend. Could happen, Steve. Um, Scott, you're a great guy and I want to be your friend, but I hate Patty. Well, you and I aren't going to hang. I got, I got a problem with that, right? Patty and I are bound and I love her and I would lay down my life for her. And guess what? Jesus died for the church. So the next time somebody tells you I love Jesus, but I hate the church, just say that's nonsense. That cannot be. Other people have told me, well, I used to go to church, but the church hurt me. And I say, no, it didn't. Somebody in the church probably hurt you. Maybe several people in the church hurt you, but the church didn't hurt you. Right? And I think, well, it makes sense. You're, you're going to be hurt by people in the church. Why? Because we don't require, for you to be a member of Redemption Church, you don't have to be perfect. It's good news. For anybody who's considering membership, you can come in. It's all right. You don't have to be perfect before you join Redemption Church. Just the opposite. The purpose for you coming to church is to become more like Jesus. So we are not going to be perfect when we're in the church because we're being developed, right? So yeah, we're going to hurt people sometimes. We're going to say unkind things. We're going to offend, all those kind of things. That's okay. This is a grace-based organization, right? So we need to offer people grace when they hurt us. That's developing us, and it's developing them. Flawed people make up the church. Now, the authors of Hebrews sees this idea of not meeting as a church as potentially fatal for perseverance in the faith. It is important. It is not an option. It is important. Emil Bruner, in his book, The Misunderstanding of the Church, said, Togetherness of Christians is not secondary or contingent. It is integral to their life, just as they're abiding in Christ. It is important if you're going to develop your faith in Christ. Now, you guys have probably heard, like I have heard people say, well, I, I love Jesus. Church doesn't do anything for me because I feel closest to God, and my church is my hiking trail, or my church is my surfboard, or my church is my motorcycle, maybe my wave runner. I can't believe that, but maybe um, my garden, right, my garage. Now, all those things may be good. You may feel close to God when you do those things, but he... Jesus did not die for your surfboard or your hiking trail or your garage or your cabin or whatever it is Right, he died for the church That's how he designed us to function with other believers There's an illustration About cedar trees, you know when you see a cedar tree and it's so amazing right cedar trees You know when you have people visit from like Southern California, they just can't believe the trees right they they're 80, 100 feet high, they're big around, they're just massive, they're so stable and just unshakable, and you think, wow, that's fantastic, and when we moved here 20, 25 years ago, when I would see um, developers come in and, and clear land to build a housing tract, I was always sad, because they took down every single tree, and I thought, well, I get you take down some of the trees, but everybody wants a tree on their property, right? Wouldn't you want a tree in your backyard? Why would you take down all the trees? Every single time, they take down almost all the trees. So I met a, a developer once, and I said, tell me, why don't you leave those trees up? You know, leave a couple of them. And he said, we can't because of the liability. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, cedar trees are huge. They're really, really tall, but their root structure is really thin, right? It doesn't go very deep, and it doesn't stick out very wide. If you've ever seen one blown over, you see it's not, it's kind of disappointing when you see the root structure, right? The way that cedar trees weather storms is the roots intertwine with the other trees. That's us. Part of being in a family of God is because we are standing with other people and helping them through storms just like they help us through storms. That is important. We're to encourage others and give accountabilities to others. Other believers need to be beside us to remain steadfast and us with them. That's part of the reason for church. Thayer's Greek definitions translates the word encourage as to extort, entreat, beseech, console, strengthen by consolation, be comforted, to instruct, and teach. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the church Christ existing as community. Holy cow. Church is important. God designed us to interact with each other so that we can remain steadfast and we are to remind each other more and more as the day is drawing near. Here's the thing. The church is the hope for the world. The church is the hope for the world. You remember in Matthew 16 where Jesus compliments 
Peter's face and he says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell cannot withstand it. Right? I went for decades thinking that, okay, the gates of hell will not withstand it. That means when hell attacks the church, we're not going to be uh, overcome. But that's not what that is. A gate is a defensive thing, right? A gate is in a, in a castle or a wall or a home, and it says that the gates of hell cannot withstand against the church. What does that mean? You and I as the church are going to hell, and we're going to knock that gate down. That's what that means. The church is an offensive weapon. The church is to go out to push the gospel and to push hell back to where it belongs. Now, I don't know if we're in the final days. People have been saying we've been in the final days for a little over 2,000 years. So I don't know what that means. We are in the final days, I should say, but I don't know if it's going to last another 2,000 years or 20,000 years or two weeks. I do know we're in dark times. You don't have to study much news to figure out that we're in dark times. But we need not despair. It's because God thought of this. Right now, the times are full of hope and promise due to the gospel of Jesus Christ due to the fact that the gates of hell will not prevail against we, the church. We should be thankful for how God designed us and his church because we're in this great family, right? This great family that is the church, this great powerful molding structure that, that moves and shapes and draws people in and goes out and blesses people. That's who we are. That's who the church is. This family has all the love and forgiveness and accountability and support that you would think a family of God would have. The church is a big deal. What a wonderful gift, and what a wonderful God for thinking of us that way. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for, um, for the gift of the church. I thank you, Lord, that you knew our shortcomings, and you knew that we would need each other, and you engineered the body that we could be able to support and encourage and empower and hold accountable and move forward and, and compel and set examples for each other, that the sum of the parts is so much greater than all those parts individually. Father, I pray for any of those here this morning who have not yet become part of your church, truly, who have not yet bent their knee and said, all right, Jesus, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore by myself. I need you. I want to be part of this great family. I pray that you would speak to them today, Lord, that you would compel them to come before you. I pray that you would help them to know that you would love nothing more than just to speak with them today and, and draw them irresistibly into your family. I ask these things in Jesus' name.